Today, we will be looking into the CIO's guide to software compliance. While the content has been designed with the CIOs in mind, it is relevant to any technology leaders that are in charge of software compliance. I will attempt to respond one critical question. As a technology leader, why should you care about software compliance? A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Camelia Balan. As Setolo mentioned already, I am the head of procurement and software compliance at Integration Works. While I am based in New Zealand, I have the opportunity of working with clients from various regions, Asia Pacific, Europe, and the United States. So right now here in New Zealand is 2.37 am, so please stay with me. Um, I hope it doesn't take longer than one hour, perhaps slightly less because it is quite early in the morning. So hopefully I can get some sleep at some point. In my current role, um, having that global reach, it allows me to bring together various experiences from different regions in one unified experience. This allows us to provide the best outcomes for our clients. As an organization, we help our clients with many things in the integration space, but my focus is specifically around procurement and software compliance. Some of the things that we help our clients with are to negotiate their enterprise software agreements, assess different licensing options when migrating from one premise to a public cloud provider, optimize their deployments, achieve compliance, and more importantly, build a solid audit defense practice. This is the agenda of our session. We will start with a brief introduction, who is integration works? What do we do? Then we will look into the Gartner report and the latest findings specifically around IT governance. We will then explore the vendor's primary focus during the COVID pandemic. We'll investigate the software compliance risk and the potential cost of non-compliance with the emphasis on managing the shadow IT and the recommended some service model. We will look into architecture and licensing, why they are equally important and why migrating to a public cloud provider, you will not resolve your compliance and licensing problems. We will share with you some strategies on how to achieve software compliance. As we go through the presentation, there will be plenty of recommendations and advice, which are based more on our experience. But this is not about us as an organization, no, neither um, us as individuals. It is about you, the listener, and how you relate to the software compliance challenges and what can you do to address them. So who is Integration Works? We are the integration and licensing experts. We've delivered over 1,000 integration projects in the past 17 years and have been working with over 30 different vendors. We are proud to have a vendor agnostic approach. We align business with technology and ensure that integration works for you while you remain compliant. Your business depends on data, processes, systems, and applications working together. Your success depends on the speed, efficiency, and reliability of that cooperation. 
while working with our clients and helping them with complex integration projects, we've identified a gap in the market around the license management, software compliance, and audit defense. This is why the license management service has become a key component of our offering. So we will start with the Gartner stats. The audit plan hotspots report from 2021 highlights how the COVID pandemic has accelerated dramatically the digital risk. This report, IT I, uh, this report identifies IT governance as the top risk for uh, 2021. We recommend you to observe the snowball effect in the following 24 months. If it's to look at the historic data, back in 2020, IT governance was um, listed on the seventh place uh, in the chart with the top risks. In 2021, it moved up to the first place, while in 2022, it moved down to the fourth place. In, in saying that the cybersecurity moved up. So what does this mean? The work from home requirement has accelerated the digital roadmaps for most organizations. They had to adopt new technologies within very short time frames. Gartner suggests that technology leaders must carefully consider how adopting new technologies has impacted the overall business and the future plans. For example, back in 2020, Gartner identified that um, adopting new technologies has to allow your employees to work remotely has led to significant new support requests, which were doubled compared to the previous years. Managing access rights brings new risks such as privileged user abuse, which is expected to increase in the following 24 months based on the Gartner IT executive survey. I recommend subscribing to the Gartner's reports. They have some excellent resources, which I believe will greatly benefit your business. For example, this um, chart highlights a set of trends, challenges, and actions that chief compliance officers must undertake. It focuses on three perspectives. What work is being done? where the work is being done from and how the work is being done. It looks at the encountered challenges and actions that must be taken. Some things to be taken in consideration, for instance, in this report, it has been highlighted that to be able to reduce risk and non-compliance, you must embed controls across your organization. Um, another topic highlighted here is around the hybrid work. It requires us to design a human-centric compliance culture. When it comes down to compliance technology budgets, they are, are projected to have grown by 180% since 2019 in response to new business needs. This, of course, indicates an interesting shift in the market trends. This uh, slide highlights the top risk categories that audit needs to provide assurance in 2022. And these are the financial risk, 77%, operational, 69%, legal and compliance, 51%, strategic 46%, 
technology 37% and talent management risk 20%. Vendors' focus during the COVID pandemic has been to organize software audits. This has been driven by various factors. Firstly, decreased vendor revenue during the COVID pandemic due to multiple lockdowns. Specifically, we are talking about the revenue generated through the standard channels. Secondly, clients being forced to adopt new projects that allow their employees to work remotely while reutilizing existing technologies. Thirdly, clients tight budget. Where they had to adopt new technologies, they had very tight budgets and therefore they had to cut some corners. And fourthly, remote workforce. When your employees are working remotely, it is very easy to become non-compliant with many vendors. A research study organized by ITAM back in 2021 has indicated that software vendors have been targeting hospitals during the COVID pandemic while their medical units were overwhelmed with coronavirus cases. According to this report, vendors registered an increase in revenue from audits of hospitals. To be noted that the ITAM uh, forum counts amongst its members, clients such as Vodafone, Procter & Gamble, and Dansk Bank. In the report, 46% of organizations advised they had experienced an increase in audit requests. 50% advised they believe there is a higher risk for an audit. And 12% advised the risk will increase. If you would like to read the full report, it has been published in the register um, back in 2021, and you should search for the title Vendors Auditing Hospitals During the COVID Pandemic. On a yearly basis, we are running as well a market poll focused on software audits and licensing compliance. We are asking very specific questions our audience to assess their software auditing experience and the future market trends, the current and future trends. The 2022 poll that we run earlier this year identified the following. 55% of respondents advised they have been audited less than two years ago, while 45% advised they have been audited over two years ago. Nobody advised they have never been audited. This is a very interesting shift as only last year when we run um, an identical market poll, 20% of respondents advised they have never been audited. What is the likelihood of being audited by a software vendor? We, we had this question multiple times. The research data from ITAM, from our end, and the research done by many other um, some services organizations, um, including the research published by Gartner, shows that this is no longer a likelihood. It is a certainty. It is a matter of when and not if. To have a successful outcome of a software audit, you have to achieve software compliance prior to receiving an auditing letter. Unfortunately, it is always easier said than done. 
achieving compliance, uh, achieving software compliance is challenging. But if you have the right strategy, it mitigates risk and saves significant costs. The big question to ask your business, um, your colleagues, your um, managers, your CEO is how much will your next software audit cost you? A large number of SAP clients have been audited for potentially being non-compliant for their indirect access. VMware are ramping their, are ramping up their audits for clients that are migrating to cloud. Microsoft have increased their licensing costs earlier this year. So the focus should be on licensing optimization. Oracle are auditing clients for their Java deployments. Here, Java was a free of charge entitlement. Right now, it is a chargeable entitlement. Therefore, you'd really need to focus your attention on such details. In addition to that, um, Oracle can change the licensing terms at any point in time without specifically notifying you. You'll have to have an entire team to monitor all the licensing changes to ensure that those changes don't impact your business and understand how do they relate to the existing agreements. This applies not only to Oracle, but to any other um, vendor. They do change their licensing terms and conditions to be able to adapt to the market um, changes. If it's to refer to IBM, the focus is their focus is on full capacity, subcapacity, and container licensing. Clients must follow through the requirements, compliance requirements, and utilize very specific tools to monitor their software deployments. To understand the risk, you need to evaluate the potential cost of non-compliance. We utilize very specific parameters to calculate the potential cost of non-compliance, and we utilize different parameters for different vendors. Based on our experience, the risk is in the range of tens of millions US dollars. The paradox of compliance, from my perspective, Compliance requires a perpetual motion machine, one that does infinite work with no energy input. In other words, achieving compliance is very challenging. Not too many clients managed to achieve software compliance across all their technologies and all their platforms, all their vendors at any point in time. From vendor's perspective, clients must be compliant across all their platforms at any point in time, and they must have a proof that they've been compliant. They need to utilize tools to monitor their software deployments and to have historic reports to prove their compliance. One of the reasons why software compliance is difficult to achieve is related to the complexity. Licensing from different vendors is very complex. Another reason is related to the licensing terms and conditions that are volatile, that are continuously changing, and you must monitor them all the time. And thirdly, building an internal SAM practice. It is difficult. Plus maintaining those skills, uh, skilled people in-house, it is even more difficult. The critical step in the process of being compliant is to gain visibility of your software assets and 
effectively manage the shadow IT across your organization. We advise to, when thinking about what to do first, we advise you to identify your risky software vendors. Then you can prioritize them and document the contractual terms of non-compliance. From there, you can build and test both a license management practice and the software auditing management process. When deploying a license blueprint, it is advisable to start small. You can implement a license blueprint across a very specific business unit and a very specific vendor, achieve quickly measurable results. And from there, you can scale and replicate success across the business and all the other business units and vendors. Typically, in an initial assessment phase, we discover lists with what people believe they have deployed in their environment. Once a license service blueprint is implemented, there is a moment of sudden realization on our client's hand, a moment of um, realization that they have deployed so many other entitlements. So one of the key benefits is that it is opening the people's eyes to the amount of shadow IT and all the software deployments that have been installed in your organization. Based on our experience, after an initial application analysis and licensing optimization, you can easily pay for the license service cost. A successful SAM service model involves a mix of skilled people, the right tools, processes, governance, and proven best practices. Usually, your SAM practice impacts not only how your software assets are going to be utilized, but also the automation, security, IT controls, and the future technology strategy. Having the right mix of people, tools, processes, and governance is key to deliver a successful SAM practice. Our approach, for example, to deployment and management of a client's software assets are, is to firstly, perform a maturity assessment of your SAM practice. Understand where you are at. Secondly, create a foundation of visibility across all your technologies, one-premise, cloud, virtualized, mobile, and emerging technologies. Thirdly, establish a baseline. Understand what you've purchased versus what you've deployed and if there are any gaps that must be addressed proactively. From there, you must run periodic reports, monthly and quarterly, to have that ability to prove the vendor that you've been compliant historically. And fifth is to make recommendations, uh, advisory services, and this is around audit defense, optimization, re-architecture of your deployments, and so on. We are moving to cloud. We no longer need a license management service. This is a big mistake. We have heard it many times. And the outcome is always non-compliance. The reality is that you need a license management practice in place when you are moving your deployments from one premise to a public cloud provider as well. 
most vendors will have very specific requirements about how you can migrate your deployments from one premise to the cloud. And they might have certain restrictions around which virtualization technology is eligible for your deployments or which operating system is eligible to allow you certain licensing terms uh, to be applicable to your environment or what tools you can utilize to monitor your license usage. From highly risky investments to poor security standards, it is very easy to adopt inappropriate practices that become the new normal. It is surprising to see that although most managers see it and understand, when dealing with a problem, they don't do anything to stop it from happening. One reason has to do with the human psychology. When faced with a situation that poses significant risk, the human tendency is to search for information that supports pre-existing behaviors. For example, software compliance is not an issue. Therefore, you don't need to do anything to address the issue. Instead of searching for information to disconfirm our pre previous uh, beliefs, we search for information to confirm our previous beliefs and discount evidence. Experts call it confirmation biases and it affects all of us. Now, going back to this slide, if you don't want your IT governance framework to explode, a good recommendation is to do not normalize the deviance. When unacceptable practices and shortcuts become the new normal, it is time to discourage confirmation biases. This Dilbert image highlights the outcome of adopting unacceptable practices across the business. We should base our assessments on realistic data and evidence. If a third party licensing expert advises you that you might have a significant um, liability that must be addressed ASAP, we, a, the, a good idea is to look into the evidence and don't normalize the deviance nor discount um, real true evidence nor encourage confirmation biases. Let's say you are currently being audited by a specific vendor. And despite um, the vendor identifying multiple non-compliance issues, they give you the green card. Our recommendation is to ensure you address those non-compliance issues that have been addressed, identified going forward, because next time when you will be audited again, you might not benefit from the same outcome. Typically, software audits audit their clients um, every three to four years and they for sure look into those clients that had significant challenges with the awarded outcomes uh, in the previous round. Determine the state of technology. Understand where you are at and how the problems you might have relate to software compliance. Our recommendation is to run a self audit to understand what has been purchased versus what has been deployed. Are there any licensing gaps that must be addressed uh, on a short term to mitigate the risk? An internal audit is typically run by your own team. Uh, in most cases, with the help of a third party licensing expert to identify where you are at. 
an external audit is typically run by a specialized auditor. And in most cases, they are looking at the penalty you are going to pay. Now, you might think that if you decided to remove the platform of a specific vendor, then you don't have to um, do anything about uh, software compliance and that you don't have any obligation towards that vendor. However, the vendors can audit you past the removal date and you still must meet all the compliance requirements. So you have to be very mindful of that and careful about your next steps when you decide to replace a very specific vendor with a completely new platform. Why is an internal audit critical? For many reasons. It creates a foundation of visibility. It assesses the compliance level. While assessing the compliance level, you can identify risks and mitigate them. By mitigating risks, you, of course, remove unnecessary costs. You, it gives you the opportunity to enforce IT controls and avoid any other future non-compliance risks. And also, it, it ensures integrity of the business. Determine the state of your team. Is your team ready to ensure software compliance? Do they have the experience and expertise required to deliver compliance or do they need the help of a third party licensing expert? Over time, we've learned that although most organizations have the in-house technical expertise, they don't have the consistency, discipline, and understanding of what to focus on to ensure software compliance. Every ITAM practitioner knows that a SAM tool is not a magic wand. When you install a tool, this is just an empty box. It doesn't understand the business context. This is the key reason why most um, ITAM initiatives fail or they are not delivered on time or they don't deliver on promise. We have seen many situations where one tool was replaced with another tool and both projects fail failed. So our uh, recommendation is to not invest in tools invest in a SAM practice. This is a known diagram in the ITAM community. I love it because it captures the essence of why ITAM initiatives fail. I typically group those reasons into generic reasons and specific reasons. By generic reasons, I mean, um, reasons that can lead to failure of any project really. And we are talking about overestimated capabilities of the tool, under-resourcing, unrealistic timeframes, lack of exact, exact buy-in. But some of the specific reasons are very unique to the sum practice you are trying to build. And we are talking about for instance, reporting. It is um, interesting to see that although most organizations deploy uh, some tools, they don't, um, they completely ignore reporting and they don't run those periodic reports on a monthly and quarterly basis to be able to proactively address any licensing gaps. Plus, the reports must be stored and kept for a specific period of time. You'll have different requirements from different vendors around that. Inventory, um, being able to understand 
what you are missing. We have seen situations where clients have deployed an entire software footprint in a completely different data center. Um, those deployments must be monitored as well. And they might not be um, active entitlements. They might be cold copies of software. Um, if they are cold copies of software, they are not chargeable entitlements by some vendors in saying that you still must monitor them and ensure they are included in the monthly and quarterly reports. Business context, you need to understand how do you get the context of your item data. Architecture, architecture is very important and it must have a direct correlation with licensing. The way how you architect will impact your future licensing costs. The recipe for success is always execution. Experts identified that 90% of business initiatives fail due to a gap between the strategic planning and execution. The reality is that we might tell you what needs to be done and how it needs to be done, but um, the research shows that most organizations will not apply that in practice. You'd need to work with a third party licensing consultancy that comes with a proven methodology to deliver outcome-based results. Of course, along the process, you'll need to commit to a strategic plan, align jobs to strategy, communicate clearly and empower your employees, measure and monitor performance, and balance innovation and control. While it may be true that software compliance is everyone's responsibility, it is usually a good idea to assign an individual and a team to have this type of responsibility. For example, if a certain audit um, ends up with a significant true up uh, um, invoice that your organization needs to pay for, or um, let's say a penalty or a new um, unpredicted um, requirement to purchase software, um, then in that situation, the board will have to approve that unexpected expense they will want to know who has been in charge of software compliance and how did uh, their organization end into that position. The responsibility for software compliance in some organizations falls under the CIO, in others <laughs> under the CTO, <laughs> in some cases under the CFO. However, none of these roles are ideal to manage a team and to ensure that software compliance is achieved. Our um, advice would be here to appoint a very specific individual, uh, and that would be the chief compliance officer. And his role wouldn't be an easy one. Um, I do love this um, image, which describes perfectly the role of a chief compliance officer. It's like riding a bike, except that uh, you are on fire, the bike is on fire, and everything else is on fire. When it comes down to compliance decisions, those decisions would have to be made by the chief compliance officer. If you involve too many people within the business in the decision-making process, the likelihood of those decisions to have a good quality is, is low. Um, there is a risk 
that there will be conflict of interests between different departments and different stakeholders. So the decision around software compliance would, would be a decision, decisions that must be made by the chief compliance officer. This is the RACI magic that we are utilizing when dealing with software audits. We typically establish a metrics with people that are accountable, responsible, consulted, and informed. Accountable are the, are, is the person that takes charge and is accountable for software compliance. Responsible is the team that delivers the work. Consulted are the people that provide input into the performance of the work that is being done. And informed are, are the people that need to be kept into the loop on the progress you are doing when dealing with any challenges around software compliance. Architecture plays an important role in achieving software compliance. The architecture and licensing considerations must be carefully taken into consideration and assessed prior to the deployment phase. They can't be isolated islands, they must work together. The way you architect will impact the future licensing costs and the compliance requirements. There are different ways of deploying your software. You can deploy uh, one premise in a public cloud provider. You can utilize containers or a virtualization technology. The deployment model you choose and the architecture you go for will impact for sure your future licensing costs. We, we've been working with clients from various regions, um, UK, USA, in Asia Pacific, and most organizations don't have the right level of expertise to ensure a software compliance meets the architecture design. Most of the times there is a significant gap a significant skills gap from that point of view. The focus should be on governance, compliance, and risk mitigation. Gartner recommends applying dynamic risk governance to define the risk management roles and responsibilities. Having a good IT governance framework is important in saying that your item practice might still fail if the IT governance framework is not correctly adopted across the business. As a technology leader, you are leading the change across the organization. When deploying or applying a new item um, governance framework, this always involves a significant change across the business. To be successful with, with the change, we recommend adopting Kurt Lewin's change management model, which is comprised from a three-phased process, unfreeze, change, and rephrase. Stage one um, refers to preparing your organization for change, helping your employees understand the need for change and getting them on board with the effort. In the stage two, uh, you alter how your organization does business. And it's about changing the structures, strategies, processes, systems, and more importantly, behaviors. When it comes down to behaviors, you have to make a clear distinction between acceptable and unacceptable behaviors. You have to adjust the key structures and incentives, identify what 
incentives to establish to ensure that those behaviors are adopted across the business. You have to model good behavior and of course, communicate uh, and repeat the communication of the vision. And stage three, it's about making sure that those changes that have been applied across the business, they do stay there and behaviors don't revert back to the original state of things. Compliance might be keeping you awake at night and for sure this is a ticking time bomb. But do you know how bad it is? Do you understand your software compliance level? How compliant are you? And what are you ready? What are you willing to do to address the non-compliance? Software audits shouldn't be coming as a surprise. And if the right IT governance processes and uh, tools are in place, then the immediate outcome will be cost reduction, licensing optimization, better visibility of your assets, procurement predictability, um, integrity of your business, and um, a better way of working for your organization and your teams. In an environment when you can implement quickly, the human nature is to download and install everything you can to, to do your job better. Some clients, after an initial blueprint, a license blueprint employment, uh, deployment, identified that developers ran out of mark downloading SQL Enterprise version instead of the standard edition. The Enterprise Edition is excellent for production. However, for development, the Standard Edition is more than sufficient. Um, they discovered as well more SQL databases than existing servers or more desktop uh, licenses than users. Uh, when it comes down to the Oracle Enterprise Database Edition server, it is very important to understand which uh, edition has been deployed. Is, is this the enterprise edition or the standard edition? Which packages you've purchased and options uh, when you deploy uh, the, the database, the enterprise edition will be automatically enabled. So you'd have to really make sure that if you've purchased the standard edition, you disable those features that are not required or you haven't purchased. When working remotely, uh, software that is correctly licensed for the server might still require entitlements for every single user and device accessing that server. One of the common violations is around the SQL um, servers where users access them uh, remotely from, by utilizing their personal devices. Of course, the software um, audits and auditors will know all these subtleties and this is why they will focus their attention on things like this. You'd have to understand what are your main risks, how you can mitigate them, what are your employees in your organization are doing and how how you can address them on a both on a short and long term. Software audits are an important way for software publishers, and it has been an important way for software publishers for quite some time to generate revenue. As the customers get caught by complexities, 
or around licensing models and rules, it becomes more challenging for them to achieve a level of compliance that will allow them to avoid any unexpected penalties. Audits can take many shapes and forms from informal SAM reviews and self-assessments to formal audit requests with third-party audit firms. And many um, audits will lead to financial, uh, to a financial exposure that is exceeding the initial cost of your software purchase. We, we have a good understanding of the software audit process and specialize in audit defense for a significant number of software publishers. So if you uh, get caught up by a, a specific audit at some point in time, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. This is all for today. I um, would like to thank you very much for your time.